<clears throat> whenever God first promised to Abraham, whenever he first said, I am going to give your descendants this land, I have no doubt that God knew fully well the enemies that Israel would face in the future. To the west floated the great sea along with a small section where the Philistines lived. To the south sat Egypt, who had been a, a world power for several hundred years, nearly a millennium. To the east sat Babylon, a rising power with which the world would soon deal with. And to the north, to the north sat Assyria. A, a wicked and cruel world power. They would take their prisoners of war and they would do terrible, awful things, skin them alive, impale them upon stakes. Terrible things. Those who were lucky were fortunate enough to have nose clips placed into their nose nostrils and drug away to another place. A terrible people they were. Yet at this time, they're the bullies of the world. They are the ones who are um, threatening not only the northern kingdom of Israel, but also the southern kingdom, Judah. And so the immediate lesson for this morning is that uh, things happen whenever you forsake God. Whenever you leave Him, things happen and it's not for the good as you'll see the immediate lesson for the Israel, for the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, that since they left God, God is going to leave them. The northern kingdom will fall. And so let's for a moment talk about the fall of the northern kingdom, the fall of Israel. The last king of Israel is Hosea. And in your Bibles, it will be spelled H-O-S-H-E-A, but it's, it's done that way to distinguish it from the prophet Hosea, because you don't want to think that, well, God took his godly prophet Hosea and made him a king of Israel, and he's a terrible guy. And so King Hosea reigns for nine years, and he made some poor choices. Raise your hand if you've never made a poor choice before. Okay, so we're kind of in that same boat as King Hosea, except for the poor choices that he made were very, very poor. He led the nation into, literally into exile because of the political alliances that he made. But ten years prior to the fall of Israel, uh, prior to Hosea becoming king, something happens. You see... The southern kingdom is attacked by not only the northern kingdom, but also by Syria. And so we read in 2 Kings 16.5, Then Rezin, king of Aram, which is Syria, and Pekah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem and besieged Ahaz, but they could not overpower him. Now this disturbed the king of Judah, and it disturbed all of the people with him. In fact, we read that they were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. And yet Isaiah, the prophet at this time of the southern kingdom, prophesies to King Ahaz of the southern kingdom, and he tells them, listen guys, it's going to be okay. He tells him to, to be careful, to keep calm, and don't be afraid. In fact, God spoke through Isaiah and told him there was nothing to worry about so long as he stood firm in his faith. But he said, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Boy, isn't that a, a valuable lesson for the world that we live in? If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. More and more, and as we heard from Brother Lance, more and more the world is becoming hostile towards Christians. It's time for us to stand firm in our faith if we're to stand at all. And so Isaiah even gave to King Ahaz a sign from God saying, Man, and in fact, Isaiah says, King Ahaz, I'm going I'm to give you a sign. 
ask for any kind of sign. And the king kind of arrogantly says, well, I don't want a sign. Because he already had plans. He was going to align himself with the king of Assyria. In fact, we read in 2 Kings 16, uh, Ahaz sent messengers to say to tiglath Pilazar, king of Assyria, I am your servant and vassal. Come up and save me out of the hand of the king of Aram and of the king of Israel who are attacking me. And Ahaz took the silver and gold found in the temple of the Lord and in the treasuries of the royal palace and sent it as a gift to the king of Assyria. And so what do the Assyrians do? They come charging down in order to rescue their newest found friend who is paying them a tribute. And we're going to give you money to keep us alive and you're not going to kill us because we're giving you money. It's one of those deals where Assyria wins. And so after this happened, after uh, Assyria was captured and much of the northern kingdom was captured by, uh, by Assyria, King Pekah is assassinated. And so King Hosea, the man who assassinated him, takes control. The problem with King o uh, Hosea was that he... He wanted all of his bases covered. And so he makes a peace treaty with the king of Assyria. But then he also double crosses the king of Assyria and makes a peace treaty down here with the king of Egypt. And it's all fine and well. I mean, you've got, you've got protection from the north. You've got protection from the south. But the king of Assyria finds out and it doesn't set well with him. In fact, it doesn't set so well with him that he comes down and he wipes out Samaria in 722 B.C. We read about the final nine years of Israel. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hosea, son of Elah, became king of Israel in Samaria and he reigned nine years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but not like the kings of Israel who preceded him. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up to attack Hosea, who had been Shalmaneser's vassal and had paid, trib paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria discovered that Hosea was a traitor, for he had sent envoys to So, king of Egypt, and he no longer paid tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore, Shalmaneser seized him and put him in prison. The king of Assyria invaded the entire land, marched against Samaria, and laid siege to it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Hala, in Gozan, and on the, on the Harbor River, and in the towns of the Medes. And so those who weren't sent into exile, those leftover survivors, fled for refuge down into the southern kingdom. Now, ultimately, so, so on the surface, it appears that it was the poor political choices of Hosea that led to the downfall of Israel. But ultimately, it was the poor spiritual alliances that Hosea had made. You see, God sent the Assyrians against the northern kingdom and sent the inhabitants of Syria into exile because they rejected him. Because they absolutely and utterly rejected their God, Yahweh. We read in 2 Kings 17, all this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They worshipped other gods and followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them, and as well as the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced. And again, later in the same chapter, we read, The Israelites persisted in all the sins of Jeroboam and did not turn away from them until the Lord removed them from his presence, as he had warned through all his servants the prophets. So the people of Israel were taken from their homeland into exile, in Assyria. And so you see, despite these people being the descendants of Abraham, despite them being ten tribes 
of the nation of Israel, despite their forefathers having entered into a covenant with God, he rejected them because of their faithlessness. You see, no matter what our, what our parents did or what our grandparents did, no matter how great of faith our family has, the determining factor in where we will spend eternity is the faith that we have. You see, their sins led them to a downfall, which led their kingdom to a downfall. You see, as a nation fills with those who rebel against God, so their wickedness entraps them and eventually overthrows them. You see, sin is a snare of our own doing. It is a snare of our own doing. Imagine for a moment, and this is going to sound silly, but... Follow me with this. Imagine for a moment that every person in the world is a mouse. Okay? Now, before you step on that person within your mind because you hate mice, recognize that you also are a mouse if every person in the world is a mouse. Okay? So, every person is a mouse, and sin, sin is a mouse trap. Okay? And so, whenever a person sins, whenever that mouse sins, what are they doing? They are laying mice traps all over the place. Every sin, another mouse trap, another mouse trap. And before too long, you have the town of mice or the nation of mice, the world of mice are paralyzed because of all of the mouse traps. They have ensnared themselves by their own sins. And eventually the mouse trap closes. And so this is exactly what happened to the northern kingdom. The effects of the nation's sins entrapped them. And so done them in. They were eventually overcome by them. Shana, just so you know, I've just skipped about three uh, Bible verses on the projector. And so then the question is, so, so now the northern kingdom is gone. It's out of the way. Israel is no more. The ten tribes have been taken into captivity and, and, and they are lost. And so now we have to turn our attention to the southern kingdom. Judah, what will happen to them? Will they follow the north and be taken captive by their sins? Or will they turn back to God? You see, all of this depends on the next king. The current king, uh, King Ahaz, he was a wicked guy. He, he partnered uh, with the Assyrians and, and paying tribute to them. He led the nation into sin by uh, worshiping other gods. And so the next king, his son, King Hezekiah, comes to the throne. Completely different from his dad. Ahaz was evil. Hezekiah was good. Ahaz led the nation away from God. Hezekiah led the nation to God. There was a revival that came about under Hezekiah. And whenever you really look at the two men, a, a beautiful lesson pops out. And that is we don't have to be like the people that we're raised by. That the cycle can be broken because of the choices that we make which is exactly what happened with Hezekiah. Early on in, his, in his, his reign, he is faced with the choice. Am I going to follow in the footsteps of my dad, or am I going to follow in the footsteps of David? Am I going to uh, lead the people away from God, or am I going to trust God? You know, in, in a way, that's a choice that we all have to make in our lives. We come to that point where we say, am I going to trust God with everything I have, or am I going to trust myself, all of my resources, and anything else that I can find? And so the first, one of the first things that King Hezekiah chose to do was to discontinue paying the tribute to Assyria. He broke that alliance. We read that Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. 
Another thing that Hezekiah did early on in his reign was he, he cleaned up all of, the, all of the junk, all of the idols, all of the altars. He got rid of those. We read that he, he removed the high places. He smashed the sacred stones and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. Let me ask you, what idols are in your life that you need to smash? I mean, I love the imagery that that verse brings to mind because it's action. I mean, he doesn't passively go, well, I probably, I probably, you know, need to maybe make some changes here and there. No, I mean, he went to work. He got down and dirty. He got rid of things. And so what is it in your life that is taking your time away from God that you need to do away with? You see, as a result of Hezekiah holding fast to the Lord and keeping the commandments that God had given to Moses, we read in verses 6 and 7 that the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. And the kingdom felt it. Yet, during the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, something happened. The king of Assyria found out. You know, he's looking at his books, he's crunching the numbers, and he says, wait a second. Wait, well, where's the gold we've been getting from, from the king of Judah? Where, where are those resources at? I tell you what we're going to do. He hasn't been paying them. Uh, we're going to charge down there, and we're going we're gonna to take some names. And that's what he did. He went down there and he destroyed uh, some fortified cities of Judah. He captured them, obviously causing the king great concern. Uh, so all of a sudden he's thinking, oh my gosh, I made a mistake. What am I going to do? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll just apologize. Uh, uh, saying you're sorry is always good whenever you're getting a, a sticky situation like this. And so I'll apologize to the king of Assyria and I will give him gold. I'll give him, I'll give him riches. And so that's exactly what we see happening. We read King Hezekiah through a message, I have done wrong, withdraw from me, and I will pay whatever you demand of me. And at this time, Hezekiah stripped the gold off of, uh, off of the covered, which he had covered the doors and the doorposts of the temple of the Lord, and he gave it to the king of Assyria. So what do we see here? We see in the midst of a person's stress, in the midst of, of, of fear and, and a distressing event, what does he do? He goes back to what his dad did. He goes back to making a wrong choice. He turns his back on God. This won't do well in time. But something happens the king of Assyria, he is so mad. He is so mad that he doesn't care about the apology. He doesn't care about the gold. He is set on teaching this rebellious king a lesson. And so he sends his commander along with other officers and a huge army to the walls of Jerusalem. And he starts to knock on the door. According to Assyria's own history, we read that King Sennacherib had boasted that he had Hezekiah trapped like a bird in a cage. And so the commander asks Jerusalem who they are depending on for help. He says, if you say we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar in Jerusalem, things are looking rough. And King Hezekiah's representatives know it. And so here's what they, they say. Listen, uh, here's an idea. Let's have this conversation in another language. Let's, let's talk in Aramaic rather than Hebrew because we don't want all of these people... You know, we don't want all of these, uh, these peasants to hear of our serious conversation. We don't want them to know how much danger they're in. We don't want to cause any panic. And the commander says, oh, 
Really? Well, but, but was my message sent only to you all? I mean, aren't, aren't, aren't they going to have to eat their filth and drink their urine also? Shouldn't they be aware of the danger that they're in? And that's in your Bible. It really is. You can read it. And I... Anyway. So then the commander, he calls out in Hebrew. And I can, I can almost see him standing up, maybe putting his chest out a little bit more, and raising his voice just a little bit. And he says this speech. He says, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you from my hand. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord. And he continues. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. And then he makes these promises. Man, if, if, you just, if you just come out and, and be with me, we're going to give you guys your own personal mansions. We're going to give you guys trees that bear fruit. Your life is going to be so promising if you just come out to us. And then he says, choose life and not death. He continues, do not listen to Hezekiah, for he is misleading you when he says, the Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? And then he provides several examples. And he says, who of all of the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand. And so the people respond by remaining silent. They said nothing in reply because the king had commanded, do not answer him. What does the king do? We read that when Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went into the temple of the Lord. He sends a message to Isaiah the prophet saying, pray for us, pray for the remnant that still survives. So Isaiah sent back this message of hope. This is what the Lord says, do not be afraid of what you have heard. Do not be afraid of what you've heard. If you're afraid of something today, Take that problem to God and receive the message from your sovereign, mighty, awesome, loving, powerful creator of the entire universe. And he's going to tell you, do not be afraid of what you've heard. You see, Isaiah further prophesied to that the commander would hear a particular report, that he'd hear a, a rumor, and that he would go and leave Jerusalem. And he also prophesied that the king of Assyria would be cut down by the sword. And just as Isaiah said, it happened. The commander hears a rumor and he withdraws. Now a short time later, the king of Assyria sends another message back to King Hezekiah. He is intent on taking Jerusalem. And he advises uh, the king and the people, hey, you know, he says, the Lord is not going to save you. He's not going to rescue you. No other God has ever been able to stand up against us. We are a powerful army. We have just decimated every nation we've come against. What are you going to be able to do about it? And so once Hezekiah received this message, he again goes to the temple of the Lord and he prays, give ear, O Lord, and hear Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by men's hands. Now, O Lord, our God, Deliver us from his hand so that all kingdoms on earth may know that you alone 
our Lord, our God. And so Isaiah sends a message back to Hezekiah telling him, this is what God says. This is what Yahweh says. He has heard your prayer. And he says to the king of Assyria that he will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. That night, the angel of the Lord slaughtered 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. Uh, That next morning, whenever they woke up, there was nothing but dead bodies, and the king of Assyria left. He goes back to Nineveh, where, just as Isaiah had prophesied, he is cut down by his own sword. Two of his sons kill him in a temple of some pagan god. The southern kingdom, for the time, is safe. This morning's lesson is super simple. What do you do whenever you get stressed? Who do you turn to whenever you have problems? Who are you currently turning to whenever you have problems? You see, Israel turned to the wrong source of strength. Not only did they choose the wrong political alliances, but they also chose the wrong spiritual alliances. Rather than trusting in Yahweh as their God, they turn to Baal and Asherah and other images made by man. And so as a result, they were destroyed by their sin and taken captive by the Assyrians. Judah, the southern kingdom, nearly went the exact same way. King Ahaz had aligned himself with a strong political ally, yet he had forsaken the Lord and rejected that ally. This was taking the nation in the same way as Israel. Yet his son Hezekiah broke political alliances with Assyria and sought to renew the spiritual alliance with the Lord. And though he temporarily returned to the alliance with Assyria, he turned back to the Lord and crisis was avoided. So again, what do you do? When the going gets tough, do you turn to God? Do you, do you look in to yourself and for your own strength? Do you, do you find somebody else and lean on their strength? What do you do? Where do you go whenever you have problems? You see, Satan, your sinful nature, and the world, they all say, no, don't turn to God. Don't find strength in God. They speak to you as the Assyrian commander spoke to the walls of Jerusalem. A little bit different message. They say, do not let the Bible deceive you. Its words have no application for you. It was written uh, hundreds of years ago in completely different culture, different surroundings. It is not even applicable to life today. So don't let the Bible deceive you. They say, don't let the Holy Spirit control you. He is attempting to make you weak. He's attempting to keep you from a certain life that you want to live. Don't let the Bible deceive you. Don't let the Holy Spirit control you. And they say, do not listen to Jesus. There are lots of people in the world who don't follow Jesus and their lives are swell. There there are people in this town who don't follow Jesus and their lives appear to be very well off. Sinful nature, Satan or the world, they say Jesus is not the only way. Find some other way. Find your own way. Yet God calls us, if we're to be Christians, if we're to live uh, Christ-centered lives, he calls us to depend on him in our time of need, to depend on his strength over ours. And so we have to understand that God will help us. You have to understand that God will help you. And so in order to understand how God helps you, uh, just have two, two suggestions on how he helps you. Number one, and this is your first fill in the blank, God helps you through Scripture. God helps you through Scripture. This is why it is important to read and to memorize Scripture so that whenever you get into that difficult situation, whenever you are nearly to rock bottom, you're able to recall Scripture to your mind and and to visualize it and meditate upon it. This is not something that comes natural to us as sinful human beings. It's something that you have to discipline yourself in, that you have to spend time in the Word, and that you have to seek out 
whenever you are in trouble. And the way you do this is that you visualize Scripture and you meditate upon it. You make it come to life within your mind. Here's an example. If you're ever feeling down, if you're ever feeling depressed, and I think if we were all honest, we would all say, yeah, we've had those points in our lives where we felt darn right awful. And so an example of a visualizing Scripture and meditating upon it comes from Psalm 42.5, which says... Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. And so to visualize and meditate upon this in your time of need, is it's more than just opening up your Bible and reading it and saying, Okay, all right, listen, soul, I know you're depressed, but you better pick it up. That doesn't always work. And so to visualize and meditate upon it, what you do is you close your eyes. And you visualize yourself standing out in a field. And you see the field, the ground all around you crumbling. You see it caving and falling into pitch blackness, uh, pitch darkness. Just a never-ending blackness that, that just goes down and down. And you recognize that you are terrified of falling into that pit. That you are terrified that the small piece of island, the small piece of land that you're standing on, You're afraid it's going to fall into also, and so that you fall into the darkness. That's what depression can feel like sometimes. And so you visualize that, and then what you do is you focus on that little piece of land that you're standing on. And you follow it, and you follow it down through the darkness, down through the pitch black, and you allow it to go all the way down to the very bottom where you will recognize that that piece of land that you're standing upon is rooted firmly upon Jesus. It is, it is found rooted in, in light and truth, and it is rooted upon God's promises to you. And so in that moment, in that visualization, you, you take hope in the fact that though the world crumbles around you, that God is not going to leave you or forsake you. And the next portion of this verse Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. And so after you've, you've, you've visualized that and you're still standing on that small little island, you see in the distance, you just see in the distance a bridge that is being built to you. And depending on where you're at in life, depending on how, how deep the depression is, depending on how, how dark uh, life is around you, will depend on how quickly that bridge is built towards you. But the bridge just symbolizes that there is a tomorrow, that there is an opportunity to get out of the situation that you're in, that you put your hope in God for you will yet praise Him. And so God helps us through Scripture. And the second way that God helps you in your time of need is revealed through 2 Corinthians 1.4. It says, God comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So God, uh, the second way God comforts you in your troubles is through other people. Through other people. You know, I want to, I I hope this isn't blasphemous, um, but I just want to change those words around just a little bit so, so that you better understand what I'm saying. God comforts others in all their troubles so that they can comfort me in any trouble with the comfort that they have received from Christ or from God. You see, it is whenever we're having difficulties that we're able to go to other people who've had those exact same difficulties or those or similar experiences, and we're able to say, how in the world did you get through this? I don't feel like there's any hope left. I don't feel like there's any light at the end of the tunnel. I need your help. And as Christians, it's no, there's absolutely nothing wrong with humbling ourselves and going to somebody else and saying, I need your help. And as Christians, we have to be ready to help others because God has helped us. And so people comfort others by praying for them and encouraging them and saying, hey, listen, I know what you're going through. Call me. Let me call you. We'll get through this. I'm praying for you. Here's how I dealt with it. So this is why it's important for us to keep people close to us. Those, those close friends that we can say, 
we just pour our hearts out to and say, I need you. And so the danger is that whenever we keep, keep our problems to ourselves, because whenever we do that, we run the risk of not receiving God's comfort as quickly as possible. And so as I begin to close, I want you to know that God knows what you need. God will give you what you need. You have to go to him for that need. You need to seek his strength whenever you're feeling weak. Whenever you're having a problem, you need to go to God. You don't need to go to uh, past alliances with the world. Go to God. You know, would, would God have let the Assyrians destroy Jerusalem if King Hezekiah had not gone to him? I think, I think that's a very real possibility. And I only say that because eventually God is going to send a nation that is going to destroy Jerusalem. And we'll talk about that next week. But the invitation is, is, you know, will you be destroyed by your problems? Will you be destroyed by your sin? Or will you seek God? Will you seek God in your time of need? See, whether you admit it or not, you need God. You need his mercy. You need his forgiveness. Because outside of God, there is nothing but judgment and eternal separation. And so you can choose life by giving your life to, to him, uh, by submitting to the lordship of Jesus. Not simply making Jesus your savior, but making him your lord to where you're seeking to live as he would have you to live. And so if you've never done that this morning, I invite you to come forward during the song of invitation as we sing, Find Us Faithful. Please stand. You see in the distance, you just see in the distance a bridge that is being built to you. And depending on where you're at in life, depending on how, how deep the depression is, depending on how, how dark uh, life is around you, will depend on how quickly that bridge is built towards you. But the bridge just symbolizes that there is a tomorrow, that there is an opportunity to get out of the situation that you're in, that you put your hope in God, for you will yet praise Him. And so God helps us through Scripture. And the second way that God helps you in your time of need is revealed through 2 Corinthians 1, 4. It says, God comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. So God, uh, the second way God comforts you in your troubles is through other people. Through other people. You know, I want to. I, I I hope this isn't blasphemous, um, but I just I just want to change those words around just a little bit so, so that you better understand what I'm saying. God comforts others in all their troubles so that they can comfort me in any trouble with the comfort that they have received from Christ or from God. You see, it is whenever we're having difficulties that we're able to go to other people who've had those exact same difficulties or those or similar experiences and we're able to say, how in the world did you get through this? I don't feel like there's any hope left. I don't feel like there's any light at the end of the tunnel. I need your help. And as Christians, it's not, there's absolutely nothing wrong with humbling ourselves and going to somebody else and saying, I need your help. And as Christians, we have to be ready to help others because God has helped us. And so people comfort others by praying for them and encouraging them and saying, hey, listen, I know what you're going through. Call me. Let me call you. We'll get through this. I'm praying for you. Here's how I dealt with it. You see, this is why it's important for us to keep people close to us, those, those close friends that we can say, we just pour our hearts out to and say, I need you. And so the danger is that whenever we keep, keep our problems to ourselves, because whenever we do that, we run the risk of not receiving God's comfort as quickly as possible. And so as I begin to close, I want you to know that God knows what you need. God will give you what you need. You have to go to him for that need. You need to seek his strength whenever you're feeling weak. Whenever you're having a problem, you need to go to God. You don't need to go to uh, past alliances with the world. Go to God. 
You know, would, would God have let the Assyrians destroy Jerusalem if King Hezekiah had not gone to him? I think, I think that's a very real possibility. And I only say that because eventually God is going to send a nation that is going to destroy Jerusalem. And we'll talk about that next week. But the invitation is, is you know, will you be destroyed by your problems? Will you be destroyed by your sin? Or will you seek God? Will you seek God in your time of need? See, whether you admit it or not, you need God. You need his mercy. You need his forgiveness because outside of God, there is nothing but judgment and eternal separation. And so you can choose life by giving your life to, to him, uh, by submitting to the lordship of Jesus. Not simply making Jesus your savior, but making him your lord to where you're seeking to live as he would have you to live. And so if you've never done that this morning, I invite you to come forward during the song of invitation as we sing, Find Us Faithful.